Thank you, David. So, here we are, the goal. John D. Rockefeller set it out very succinctly for us. It's pretty straightforward. We get up early, we work late, and we find oil. And the shareholders and the directors of the exploration companies <coughs> believe they can do the same. Here's the model which we've constructed. We start at the top with the acreage. Is the acreage good? Well, move around to the right. Is the company funded for the exploration? Then the GNG work will be able to identify leads, prospects, targets. We then drill it. We find the oil. Using this model, if the oil is there, the oil will almost certainly be found. But I don't want to be negative at all. There are some great successes by London-based companies, and um, in the earlier part of this um, talk, I'll be focusing on the London-based companies and, and the smaller ones. Here we've got five great successes, which I've chosen. Um, the one at the top there, Gulf Keystone Petroleum, operating in the Kurdistan region of Iraq. 12.5 billion barrels of oil in place on their portfolio going forward, 40% to 80% slice, big in anybody's book. Next two, Emerald Energy, Gulf Sands Petroleum, they were operating in Syria and Emerald Energy in Colombia. Tallow Oil, David's former company of course, um, great success there, 1.4 billion barrels, 2P and 2C. And a shareholder favourite, Cove Energy. Decent slice of very large gas discovery in East Africa. Here we have a picture of our chairman, uh, young Mr Grace, um, congratulating all of us. We've all done very well. And here's a list of people who have done very well. And of course down the side here we see local communities, um, local people, local companies, very important, um, corporate social responsibility, vital part of the, of the sector. Oh, and there's, there's a few more here. Um, we won't read them all out. Somewhere down the bottom, we've got the company directors. I'm sure they're not quite the bottom of the list in terms of how they're being paid, but it's a pretty long list. Oh, have we forgotten anyone off the list? Well, yeah, there's the shareholders. I took that photograph last week at an AGM they're, um, they're, they're looking a bit sorry for themselves, but you know maybe, maybe there's hope. Maybe there's hope. Let's get a bit more serious and look at a technical issue, which did actually crop up this morning, purely by coincidence. These talks are completely independently um, constructed. What I'm doing here is saying, well, let's imagine we're the board of a company. We're either going to be listed, we're going to be formed, or we're developing an exploration program. How many wildcats are we going to have to drill in order to be 90% sure that we're going to get at least one commercial success from that? And on the graph here, we've got the individual well chance of success along the bottom, and up the side is the number of wells that our program would need to, need to have. Pretty alarmingly, when we're at the left-hand side of the x-axis, down at a 5% chance of success. The number of wells that we would have to um, drill is um, almost off the scale. It's 45 wells. Um, so you'd have to drill 45 wildcats at a 5% individual independent chance of success to be sure of getting one commercial discovery, at least one. And that's at 90%. That's still a 10% possibility that you wouldn't find anything. Frontier wildcatting somewhere down in that region, as we have heard before here and as we heard this morning. Moving further across to the right, clearly the number of wells goes down with higher chances of success, but you still kind of reach the view that anything much less than about 10 wells, 8, 9, 10 wells in a program, you're taking risks in terms of whether you're actually <coughs> going to get a commercial discovery from there. So here we are, we're a shareholder. Three choices. We can invest in an EMP, which is funded to do some work, but not an extensive exploration program. Or we can invest in a larger company, which has got a bigger exploration program. Or 
we can spread our risk. So instead of relying upon the companies to spread the risk through their portfolio, we spread the risk ourselves by spreading our money across uh, the number of companies, the portfolio approach. We'll now look at an eight-year period, um, thanks to Opus Executive Partners for the, um, for the data on, on, these, on these slides. The first five years of that five-year study, there was a 34% rise in oil prices. Um, and about a third of companies did reasonably well in terms of share price performance, the doubling. But about two-thirds delivered a disappointing reduction. Overall, pretty much break even, but that's only true if you include the 10 top performing companies. If you take those out, then the rest of the London based, London listed market experienced a share price drop of 35%. There's perhaps some logic in taking those top 10 out, and that's because when you look at the subsequent performance, um, only two of those ten over the following three years continued to do well. And the other eight of them didn't, and they lost up to 90% of their individual share price. So good performance doesn't necessarily continue. What's happened more recently, 18-month period, they're at the top, and then the most recent 12 months, pretty much similar figures for both of them. About a quarter of companies doing reasonably well but about three quarters, something like that, not doing well at all. Overall, very disappointing result for shareholders. So we mentioned five examples here. Um, let's just have a look at the actual share price charts for them to see how the shareholders have benefited. I'll just make a comment <coughs> that, of course, is the London Shard. Um, the oil column in the Jurassic formation alone at Gulf Keystone Petroleum's Shaikan discovery in Kurdistan is three times, more than three times, the height of the shard. It's actually difficult to imagine an oil column that's that big. So therefore, you know, the shareholders in Gulf Keystone Petroleum must be absolutely coining it. Well, when we look at the share price, we see that they're actually not. History of that particular company Initially operating in Algeria, didn't work out quite as well as the company had hoped. Refocused on Kurdistan, made some staggering discoveries there, but in terms of delivering share price performance, uh, shareholder value, I think the shareholders are saying, well, we're still waiting for our payday on that one. Emerald Energy had a few problems in Colombia, had a blowout. Following the blowout, the company was refinanced in 2003. New management team were brought in. Portfolio change, great success, sold to Sinochem. Gulf Sands Petroleum, Emerald's partner in Syria, um, they perhaps had the opportunity to sell out in 2009 when Emerald did. I don't know whether they did, maybe they did. But they chose not to and they chose to continue and for about 12 months they continued to do very well but then one of these unfortunate events and the unforeseen came along that was the trouble in Syria and the share price has clearly suffered from that. Tallow oil, great success, bit of a hiccup there in the financial crisis but um, that's all part of the game. But the last couple of years found it more difficult to repeat success with the exploration drill bit. Cove Energy, pretty flat to start with, uphill climb and taken out. I've got another nine examples. We don't want to go through all these in detail because we'd be here all day. Example there in the middle, Casa Oil and Gas, um, had some disappointing drilling results, but they've very recently changed their um, strategy, focusing on production and they've um, experienced a, a welcome recovery in the share price. I'll just mention there an unconventional Nighthawk energy. The shale play in the Denver Basin in Colorado. A lot of enthusiasm about it, but the shale couldn't be made to flow commercially. Um, had some recent success with a conventional or semi-conventional reservoir that was found as a spin-off from the shale exploration work. Lenny Gas and Oil, 
Another interesting kind of turnaround story. Had some problems with their portfolio in Spain. Decided to refocus on Trinidad, and some of you may well have seen two or three RNSs in the last three weeks or so about great results there. I think there's only a couple I'll mention on here. Sterling Energy, interesting one. They're one of the explorers in Kurdistan that didn't really find anything, um, and they've actually surrendered the acreage. That was funded on a farm-out deal to ADAX, which was paid for, them, paid for by the Chinese, of course. Um, so still struggling a bit. Interesting because their management team for the last five years has been the very successful ex-emerald energy management team. Trying very hard. Does it mean that a good management team, success doesn't automatically follow? Perhaps it does. Last one on here, Extract Energy. They perhaps had three good shots at delivering success. First one on the, um, of those two <coughs> sort of bumps along the end there, that was a drilling operation in Turkey, which made a discovery. Production facilities were <coughs> built, put on stream, but unfortunately when the reservoir was put onto commercial production, it started flowing water instead of instead of oil. So that wasn't so much a, a dry hole as a, as, a, as a dry commercial field. Went again with a farm out deal on some offshore acreage to one of the world's super majors. The problem there was that the super major drilled the hole, declared it tight hole status, and wouldn't tell the company what they'd actually found, which makes it difficult for shareholders. Um, and finally, there was an attempt um, to drill a high impact wildcat with a very low chance of success. It was drilled, didn't come in. Here we have public enemy number one, excessive dilution. Companies don't have the money in the bank. They can't find the drilling success. They don't have the big di commercial discoveries. What do they do? They have to keep coming back to the market to get more funding as the share price goes down. Some of us call it death spiral financing. These numbers are not just made up. They're not just figures I've plucked off the ceiling. These are real examples. So I think in general, in terms of the companies to which I'm addressing here, expectations aren't being met. You know, people are genuinely enthusiastic about the future. The broker analysts do their thing on the data. Um, the directors seem to believe that things will come good. The shareholders are optimistic. You see it all the time on the bulletin boards. You know, okay, there's a bit of negativity on some companies. It swings around, but generally speaking, people are enthusiastic. But performance seems to defy all these predictions. Well, why is that? I think we could probably write books on that on that subject. One of one of the things that I think is, is significant, which has actually cropped up earlier today in the, in, the, in the talks, is unforeseen events, negatives, negatives that one doesn't think are going to come in, but which do come in. And I think an example of that would be an issue with a license. You've got a license on your acreage. You're not going to come in on Monday morning and, and the chairman say, oh, we, we've got some good news. We found it's two licenses instead of one. We didn't know that another license had been included with the one that we've got. What's more likely to happen is that a letter turns up from a law firm somewhere saying our client claims that the license actually belongs to them or that they, they are entitled to a slice of your portfolio. That's a pretty common problem across the mining sector as well as the oil and gas sector. Say common. It, not everybody is experiencing it, but it's certainly not unknown. So the final point there, who is ultimately responsible for success and failure in these companies? There can be odd occasional acts of God, things can come out of nowhere, but when <coughs> one's looking at it in the round, the responsibility has to be with management. It's the management that are responsible for 
setting up the company, for selecting the people working in the company, developing the strategy, the plans, the budgets and so on. And also highlighted in red, the assessment and management of risk. This is an item which has been heavily emphasised recently by the UK Corporate Governance Code, um, a key thing for companies to do, company boards to do. Assess what the risks are and manage them. And maybe what some companies are not doing is allowing enough headroom to actually you know, cover the situation when things don't pan out quite as hoped. So let's drop back to the model that we saw a few moments ago. Got some comments on there. The $64,000 question, is the acreage good? You know, companies believe that the acreage that they have contains oil. And in some cases it does. In some cases it contains a great deal of oil. Is the company funded to do the work programme? Well, companies certainly are funded. Um, drilling is taking place. But is there enough funding? Are the companies funded sufficiently to do large enough programmes? And of course, the less drilling that you do, the higher the overhead cost per well that you drill because the fixed overheads of the company, board of directors, the offices, the nominated advisors, the auditors, accountants, the lawyers, all the rest of it, the invoices come in all the time when you're running any company. Those costs are then carried by a smaller number of wells, so cost per well is increasing. G&G. &G, Good quality G&G &G will identify targets. I think that's true. Um, the chances of success figures that we saw earlier, that we've seen at Finding Petroleum before, they do seem to show that chance of success pre-drill is not so very different to what's actually found in terms of the strike rate. But with an exception, and that's the frontier wildcats. You know, frontier wildcatting does appear to be much more risky than the geologists and geophysicists think it will be. Quite why that is, I'm not sure that we know. Drill the hole. Perhaps that's the apparently easier part of the job. I certainly couldn't do it, but that's the point. It is a difficult job drilling these holes. That's why drilling managers are well rewarded within the sector. Beware of the technical failure. There is always a problem of a technical failure with a hole. So we then move round, we strike the oil. The word of warning there, is enough flow testing done? Doing a short duration flow test and thinking that the reservoir is good, thinking that the unconventional play is good on the basis of a short test. It's tripped up various companies and quite a few shareholders. And then, as I mentioned a few moments ago, if it does all work out, Beware of the claim to title. Beware of the challenge to the assets, which, as some of us in the room will be well aware of, can be something of a nightmare for companies and shareholders and extremely destructive and distracting. So let's move out to a wide-angle view of the industry as a whole. I believe these figures are broadly correct. Last year, the world consumed about 50 billion barrels of oil and gas equivalent. Found last year about 20 billion barrels. And views vary about shale, but there are certainly more negative voices around, perhaps publicly, about shale than there have been in recent <coughs> times. Does this suggest that um, the industry, the technologies and investments are not delivering? I think a statistician might probably say, oh, well, one year's data is not enough. You'd need a longer trend to actually assess the situation. But I think an experienced manager might well say, mm, warning signs. What are our remedial programs? Do we need to address further points to improve things for the future? Now we can contrast the micro with the macro situation. At the macro level, obviously, future oil and gas production requires continued exploration. 
But when we're looking at it from the point of view of an individual company, is expiration the thing that we should be using to deliver shareholder value? Do we want to keep expanding our reserve base or do we want to say, well, actually, we should be focusing on what we have and monetizing that um, through putting it onto production, focusing on the downstream operation rather than the upstream. Here we have one of these <coughs> typical We Buy Your Gold adverts. Um, where do you get gold from? Well, you can get it out of the ground, mine it. Expensive operation. It's much easier to buy gold from the public, get it out of their sideboards. Same thing with black gold. Do we drill for it? Do we take all those risks? Or do we simply buy it from another company? Do we go down the mergers and acquisitions line? That might be beneficial to us as an individual major, super major, whatever it might be, but it's not actually generating oil for the economy as a whole, the world economy. One final point there for the couple of shareholders whose photograph appeared earlier. Mergers and acquisitions premiums do indicate that share prices for companies with good assets tend to be too low. That's why one gets premiums paid. So it could be that those two shareholders that we saw, they're still waiting for the knock on the door to their company from the mergers and acquisitions um, person to say, oh, well, actually, someone's interested in buying your, buying your company and your assets. So here's some conclusions. Yes, exploration is delivering, but it's probably not delivering enough. And a lot, of, a lot of people are benefiting from exploration, but not always the shareholders. And I think we see that positive achievements and positive expectations are being dragged back down by unforeseen negatives, which can be across a whole host of things, in, including but not restricted to politics. And the consequence of all that is perhaps unsurprisingly you know, some shareholders are getting a bit um, miffed by all this. So I'd like to close again with um, a quote from John D. Rockefeller. He's telling us, don't keep doing the same old stuff. Stop doing it. Look at new things. We'll look at new things to do. That's the way to succeed. But what can we suggest as new things to do? He doesn't tell us, of course. Could he be saying in new paths, well, maybe you should be looking at physical new paths, new geographical areas, go to remote parts of the world that haven't been explored before, go to the Arctic, let's say. Or could it be that we should be looking, perhaps in a more technical way, looking at unconventionals, looking at shale, looking at shale oil, um, Looking at enhanced oil recovery, as, as was said this morning, you know, something like 75% of the oil that's actually been discovered in terms of gross oil in place is still there. Worldwide recovery, I think, at a previous finding, petroleum was pitched at about 22 to 23% internationally. Most of the oil is still there. Or should we be going to places such as Iraq, Iran, maybe Saudi Arabia, if we can gain access to somewhere like that, and to Russia. You know, I deal with people, they say, oh, no, Russia, I wouldn't be interested in Russia. My board wouldn't consider Russia. But I've had the same thing from people talking about Italy. You know, our board of directors would never consider investing in Italy. The advantage with some of those places is, well, the old adage, where do you find oil? Well, you find it next door to where oil has already been found advantage with that Middle East Russian type dimension is that it's, at least it's we know that the oil is there or perhaps another angle on, on the wise words from uh, the founder of Standard Oil is we should be looking at different commercial models should we be looking at different financial models different business models different ways of actually structuring what we do um, and I'll just finish there, but I think I'll just say that the objective of the oil and gas exploration industry isn't actually to find oil and gas. The real objective 
is to make money and to make money for the people who are putting their hard-earned savings up to finance it. Thank you for your attention and any questions?